Hey everybody, David Chatham here with Angel Oak Creative. Welcome to our uh, Nonprofit State of Minds podcast. Uh, this is uh, uh, a new series that we're doing that's really focusing on the nonprofit community and uh, just really sharing information and, and uh, best practices to try to equip all of us to be better and stronger nonprofits. So excited today, we have Patton McDowell. He is the founder of the PMA Nonprofit uh, Leadership. He's a consultant that works with nonprofits, uh, eats, sleeps, and breathes them, if I understand correctly. So excited to have you here. Uh, Patton also has his own podcast called Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Uh, uh, we were just talking, uh, celebrating their 200th episode uh, this week. So congratulations on that, Patton. We'd love to have you introduce yourself a little bit. Well, David, delighted to be here with you, and congratulations to you and the work you and your firm are doing. Yeah, we're on number, this is number two, so you know, we've got a little um, ways to go to catch up with you. Hey, I'm honored to be among the first episodes, <laughs> and uh, I know you will build upon this as, as you are doing throughout uh, the many communities you're serving, so thank you for that, and I'm fortunate as you are to be working in the nonprofit sector. I have been, in fact, myself for almost 30 years. Wow. Um, started with the Special Olympics organization, uh, was able to work with two universities here in North Carolina, UNC Wilmington and Queens University of Charlotte. Go Seahawks. Indeed, I knew you and I shared some uh, Seahawk <laughs> love. Yes. And, and then uh, about 14 years ago, started this consulting practice called PMA Nonprofit Leadership. And we focus on, as the title implies, leadership development of both staff and board members and nonprofit organizations. And then the related functions that every nonprofit leader listening understands, uh, fundraising and strategic planning. And so those are our areas of specialty. And we've been fortunate to work with almost 275 nonprofits throughout wow. the Carolinas. And now increasingly through our leadership programs, we're working with individuals across the country. Wow. Uh, we have a mastermind program that is a leadership development kind of cohort-based training, and that has really taken off, and it's exciting to see nonprofit leaders from all over the country joining us for that. Well, congratulations. That's, uh, you know, I mean, I was in a meeting, uh, I guess, last week with some groups, and we were talking about secession planning. Right. Yes. And uh, just how important that is and how under um, how how there's a, a lack of attention paid to it. Right. That uh, it's just uh, part of being a strong nonprofit is being prepared. Right. And succession so planning is, is part of that. So, well, you, you're you know, obviously you're well versed in the in, in North Carolina nonprofits. Uh, you know, the idea for this year, the theme, as you and I have talked about and we've shared with other folks in previous podcasts is, you know, the state of nonprofits, right? North Carolina is an amazing state. I grew up here. I went to school here in the, you know, in the state and, and now living back in Raleigh and, and just working. We, we're blessed to be able to work with nonprofits across yes. the state and have just really appreciated that. And, you know, I feel like we're a better state because we have a thriving nonprofit sector, or at least my opinion of that is. What is your, uh, what is your, how would you describe the state of nonprofits in North Carolina? What, you know, what, what would be your take on, you know, where we are with, with nonprofits in, in that sector? Yeah, I am very encouraged because again, <clears throat> uh, when I started, um, you know, I, I think many uh, aspiring younger professionals didn't necessarily view the nonprofit sector as a career track. And, and so I grew up in North Carolina, as you did up in Elizabeth City, up in the Northeast corner. And, and remember when I was fortunate to intern with Special Olympics, and, and I think many people and myself included thought, all right, well, this will be fun to intern with an organization in DC for a summer, but never really thinking about it as a career opportunity. Yeah. And so my encouragement, David, is now uh, years later, as I have kids that have been through college and looking at career aspirations, more and more talented individuals are considering the sector as a place to work. That's a great. And so, yeah. you know, as you said, what, if there's a headline, I'm like, Hey, you know, when, when I was going through college and I, God, I feel like this is such an old man kind of statement to make, right? Well, back when I was going to college, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Uh, but 
But now virtually every university in this state has some kind of program, undergraduate or maybe in graduate, in nonprofit management, nonprofit leadership. That's great. Philanthropic studies. So, so again, David, you and I know we have a wonderful university system and colleges of the private nature. A lot of them are producing talented individuals, so the sector will benefit. And that, to me, is a headline because the counter headline, unfortunately, is the sector still has significant turnover. And to your point about succession planning, that's what that's what is is disappointing at times because these organizations need talent, and yet we're still not quite where we need to be. Well, and that was my next question. What what can we do better, right? So what what's your take on the turnover, right? What what's causing the turnover? Is it burnout? Is it pay? Is it uh, you know a combination of those things? You know what 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 do you think is causing that? All of the above. Um, <laughs> but I think the, the the subtle thing that I think maybe is the root cause, because sure, the sector needs to pay better, and I think there's some progress, but we've got a long way to go. There is definitely burnout exacerbated by, of course, a pandemic. But I also think a lot of nonprofit organizations struggle with clarifying actual job descriptions and the roles the staff plays. So in other words, I take the job. I'm excited about it. I thought they wanted me to do this, but hey, we need you to do everything else. And exactly. so I find I find a lot of people saying, you know, I, I thought I was just going to be a fundraiser and then They've got me doing the website and special events and everything else. So at least in my experience, David, I talk to a lot of uh, individuals who do leave and they're like, you know, I love the cause, but I, I, I feel like it wasn't clear what I was supposed to do. And so ultimately, you know, that wore me out. That's interesting. The, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's interesting. The, you know, the, the idea that, you know, I think there's a little bit of badge of honor when, you know, you talk to a nonprofit leader and they talk about how many hats they wear, right? And, True. and all the things that they do. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's probably the thing, to your point, that brings them to a place of, I just can't keep up, right? I just can't do this anymore. You know, as you're talking to nonprofit leaders, I mean, that's that's your audience, right? So as yes. you're talking to nonprofit leaders, what are you hearing about from them as to, you know, what what's helping them to to overcome some of those challenges, right? Of of wearing five different hats. You know, they're the they're they're not just the organization leader, they're also helping with fundraising, they're also out doing talks to the community, they're also, you know, heading up the board meetings. They're, you know, all of the things that these nonprofit leaders are expected and called on to do. How how do you not do those things but still be successful, right? Or how do you find some balance there? Yeah, well, you said it that the balance is the perfect word. And it starts with nonprofit leaders modeling. Um, you know, a balanced lifestyle, because, again, th there's such passion for these causes, um, but you can absolutely burn out, you know, because particularly the, the challenges that these nonprofits are facing in our communities uh, can be just simply exhausting. So nonprofit leaders, I think, have to model, yeah. you know, some degree of balance. You have to unplug and give yeah. yourself breaks. And what I'm seeing, David, the, the, the uh, successful nonprofit leaders now are maybe using some of the pandemic lessons and saying, well, you know, maybe we could have greater flexibility with the schedule of our team. You know, I've seen progress there. We have to get our jobs done. I'm not saying you can't, you know, right. some organizations can't let everybody work from home because of the nature of what they do. But are there opportunities to be more flexible and allow, you know, kind of a hybrid work environment? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see that as maybe one way of, Whereas if you have to have a kind of rigid schedule as a leader and you expect everybody to you know, work the same amount of hours in the same way you do, that's not necessarily going to succeed. Yeah. And so I, 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 I just I, my tip or my suggestion would be just to be able to step back and evaluate how we work and, and yeah. literally how that transfers into you know, time and schedule and things like that. And, you know. I think there's a lot of expectations placed on leaders by boards, uh, by donors, uh, you know, and I'm not blaming anybody, right? But I mean, they the they, certainly, they certainly have high expectations of, you know, of, of performance, of 
of, of results. And, you know, I think certainly it's with all good intention, right? If they don't, they don't want to drive somebody to, you know, to quit or any of those things, but how, what can board chairs, what can board leaders do, board members do to, to help, uh, you know, uh, to help an organizational uh, organization's leader find that balance or to to help them to find a path to that, you know, speaking of your path to nonprofit leadership, you know, what is a path to that, you know, to getting the board on board, right? Getting the board to the place where they say, you know what, you've got to have a balance too, because a board can sometimes be a, a factor. I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm glad you raised that question because I do think that's a factor. And many of the nonprofit leaders I talk to and interview in our podcast uh, the board all, almost always comes up, and sadly, not always as a positive topic, right? They're, and we love too, boards, right, Pat? It, it, not, we do. <laughs> we do love our board members. And and here's the thing, David, they are off, they, almost always, they're, they're well-intentioned. They want to help, but they sometimes go in one of two directions. They're either micromanaging you, so that's driving an executive director crazy, or they're disengaged. You yeah. know, they signed up, but they don't show up anymore. Yeah. And so to answer your question, though, the best nonprofit leader success I've seen, again, it's clarity, just like yeah. I was mentioning, the job description clarity of the staff yeah. is equally important that your board members truly understand. Do they have a job description? Yeah. I can't tell you how many organizations I see. Well, a board member will say, well, yeah, they gave me something when I signed up, but I don't really know. And so then board members are freelancing. Right. And therefore, and when you have different board members freelancing in different ways, it's no wonder the staff are, are, are going crazy. Yeah. And so, again, we need to utilize the talent of our boards, but it starts with the clarity of their job descriptions. And then we can all be moving in the same direction. Yeah. Yes. We were, uh, I was speaking with a board the other night and it, you know, it was, it was obvious this was a really high functioning board. I mean, they, they worked really well together, uh, you know, and they, they encouraged leadership to, you know, to, to do things within reason and, you know, and all of that. So it, it was refreshing to see that they, they had a perspective that seemed to take all of those things into consideration and weren't, you know, micromanaging. They weren't, you know, they weren't disengaged, but they were really kind of in that perfect spot of, of being involved. You know, the, where I see a uh, sometimes where I see boards uh, have a negative Im impact is kind of uh, almost keeping a a, 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 a chokehold around resources, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what is and, and it sounds like you might know what I'm talking about there. So I don't know. I'll, I'll let you talk about it. So what is it? What does that mean to you? What what is that? How does that resonate? Well, we we in many in the sector have heard of kind of what they're now calling the overhead myth. You know, Thank a you. lot of a lot of the the accountability metrics, which aren't bad, but originated back in the 90s, you know, when organizations like GuideStar were profiling nonprofits and bringing, shining a light on, on the numbers yeah, and, and holding organizations accountable. Because sadly, like in every sector, there were a few bad apples. And so more and more donors said, hey, I want to understand where the money goes if I'm going to yeah. contribute, right? Yeah. But the pendulum swung so hard in that way that the accountability metric was now being used as a weapon against yeah. nonprofits and in essence saying, don't spend any money on anything except direct programming. Right. And therefore, and back to your point, David, why we aren't paying our staff enough and why we aren't giving them the resources to do their job, because some people in some ways arbitrarily decided that none of your money should be invested back into the team. And yeah. in other words, you shouldn't be spending money on overhead as like that's just a dirty word right and and so yeah i i think that the pendulum is swinging back a little bit more balanced yeah but i, I want to say to board members back to your point they invest in their businesses they would expect their businesses to succeed because they are paying for the talent and right. they are giving them good computers to work on and good tools to utilize and so why shouldn't the nonprofit sector have the same benefit of that level of investment? And I don't mean exorbitant, right? But Reason. to your point, let's let's invest in these causes. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, thank yeah, thank you. I, and I, I I could jump on my soapbox real quickly. But I'm gonna. <laughs> I jumped I'm gonna, right with you, right? I'm I jumped gonna, right I'm with gonna you. Step, I'm gonna step down. We're uh, 
you know, but uh, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, I agree 100% and just so glad that the, that first of all, it's being uh, identified as a myth. And then secondly, that hopefully is being busted in a way that uh, is, uh, is helping nonprofits to, to have some, have some room, right? I mean, some margin. I mean, nonprofits run so lean and most of them yes. do anyway, that okay. they have no margin, right? They have no room. Go ahead. I know you want to say yeah. something. Well, no, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in, but no, you're, you're right. Fine. If we, if we starve these wonderful organizations, they're not getting anything done. Yeah. So I want to say to a donor, well, all right, well, you want to feed the hungry or you want to house those without homes or you want to educate our kids. But if if the team that does that is constantly turned over because you starved them, yeah, then you're, you're, the program doesn't exist. And so yeah. I hopefully we'll find balance, as you said. Well, I think we made our point. Yes. <laughs> Good soapbox to be on, yeah, though, for a minute. We won't, we won't beat that horse any longer. So uh, thank you for that, though. So as you're as you're talking to these nonprofit leaders and you're 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 assessing them and you're, you know, what are those three or four characteristics of a nonprofit leader that that are that they have in common? What are those kind of commonalities between successful nonprofit leaders? Well, number one, effective communication um, in, in every aspect, uh, certainly in fundraising, as you know. You have to be able to articulate a clear case for support, what your organization does and why it merits investment. But communication also translates into every other direction with your board of directors. Uh, and certainly as a leader, the ultimate form of communication and maybe leadership is your ability to attract and retain other talented people. Yeah. So I, I emphasize when we do our mastermind kind of training workshops, we talk about in fact, I think there's about a dozen key skills and experiences, but the ones you and I've talked about that rise to the top is is the ability to effectively communicate in, in each direction. Um, I think there's an increasing amount of, of investment in professional development mm -hmm. uh, and in particular networking. Yeah. You know, one, again, a silver lining of the pandemic maybe was that Everyone was stuck in their Zoom room. They started <laughs> connecting maybe with people they didn't otherwise. We got, we got desperate, right? We exactly. had to find somebody to talk to. So. And I've seen some really encouraging coalitions emerge because you yeah. were calling your peer in the other, yeah. you know, the next state or the next city and learning. And so I hope maybe that will continue because I do think the best leaders are intentional about not just being so kind of um, isolated in their organization, we can learn from each other. No, that's and, a, and, you know, and, that's and, a great observation. I mean, I do, I mean, you, you don't hear networking talked about as a skill necessarily, right? So I but, think but it, it, but it, it really is. It, it is something that has to be exercised, right? I, and worked on. I, I really do think it's a discipline. You said it right, David, that, and I encourage every leader to identify two comparable peers who are two people in your network uh, may outside of your organization, but are doing similar roles that you can bounce things off of. And, and again, I think it's good to have somebody local, but somebody out of town. And I also suggest you identify two people that are in aspirational positions of yours. So in other words, if you're, you know, in the middle of a management team, but you want to be an executive director someday, all right, well, let's connect you with some executive directors who are in roles that you can learn from because yeah. the whole sector benefits if if and I find most people are willing to help someone who's maybe five years behind me on the path. Yeah. And so as we build the North Carolina, you know, network of nonprofit strength. Yeah. Again, that those would be some of the things I would encourage our nonprofit leaders and aspiring leaders to do. No, that's great. Anything else? You got communication, you got networking, any one or two more that you think are worth uh, making sure we hear? As a liberal arts major uh, coming out of Chapel Hill, um, financial management mm -hmm. is often among the the dozen skills and experiences we talk to folks about that they want they need to work on. In other words, your passion for the cause. Many folks come through the program side, you know, or yeah. even fundraising, but you ultimately have to manage a business. Yeah. Right. Whether we, you know, regardless of the tax code, you know, whether right. it's a nonprofit or for profit, it is a business. And so I'm encouraging nonprofit leaders to be very intentional about you need to you don't have to be an accountant 
<laughs> but you need to understand the, the numbers. Right. What are the key revenue drivers of your nonprofit? What are the key expense drivers? Yeah. Uh, what you know? How do these reports work? Because increasingly, your donors, your board members, and others are going to expect you to explain not just the numbers, David, in your organization, but how you fit into the larger ecosystem. You know where dollars go to support, you know, your cause. So that's probably the other one I would lift up that most uh, aspiring leaders I've run into generally say, yeah, that's probably something I need to work on. So those are the three areas or so that you, you know, feel like are most important. Is that, re is that reflective in why people come to your organization for help? Do they, what, what, what's kind of driving them to reach out to you or, 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 you know, prompting them to say, you know, we could really use some help strengthening our leadership here. Yeah, you, you nailed it. It, it we, we kind of headline with leadership. That's okay. really what I've gravitated toward. Uh, now, obviously, within under the umbrella of leadership are all these other activities from fundraising to strategic planning to right. personnel management to program design. Um, but most of all, organizations come to us for leadership development, staff or board, and then strategy and strategic planning. Because again, as a, as a recovering fundraiser myself, um, if you don't have clarity on the strategic plan, it's hard to raise money. Yeah. And so often we'll have organizations or individuals come to us, hey, help me raise more money. And I'm like, all right, but well, we need to start with your plan. Yeah. What what exactly, you know, how do we articulate mission, vision, action as a concise and effective framework for raising dollars? And so that's often what kind of our coaching and counsel uh, has evolved into. And and frankly, I'm even more into there are kind of three sectors, David, of, of okay. leaders I'd like to help. Yeah. Um, one is the one you and I talked about, the exciting advent of more emerging leaders. They're, they're coming right out of college. They studied nonprofit management. They want to get you what, in. There is a right? generation of passionate people coming. I mean, we have, Amen some, to we that. have a few here. And everybody at Angel Oak is passionate, but I mean, the ones that we've hired recently that have come directly out of college and want to work in nonprofit in the nonprofit world are just they're so enthusiastic about it and they're so committed to it and are just you know we, we want to pay well and we do our best to do that but they're like you know what I just want to do this work I want to you know, I want to pay I want to make my bills and I want to do that but I just want to make an impact on these nonprofits so we're really blessed to be able to have some of those folks. I'm sure you're seeing that too, but I'm excited about that too. Just, yeah, I yeah. love the, I had, um, I, nonprofit sector was not even on my radar, right? Not, not because I didn't care about it necessarily, no, exactly. but just because it, it, I didn't think of it as a career, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't think about, okay, you know, I, I, I can get my degree in communications and then I could use that for, you know, for that. I always thought, well, I'll get my degree and then I'll volunteer, right? Or yes, I'll, yes. You know, and now it's it, it might be the first choice as opposed to kind of a, a fallback, right? <laughs> that, that's so well put. And that's what I think is encouraging to both of us that now that that new wave of talent is coming out and I'm I'm energized by it. I, I'm fortunate. Uh, we've had interns at our firm from graduate programs there at, at NC State and UNC yeah. Charlotte. And I'm now working with uh, undergraduate and graduates at Cornell University. Oh, wow. So, I, so I'm seeing this, this emerging leader sector. And it's like, it, it it has me thinking, all right, how, how do we help them? Because yeah. I know, as you and I talk to the existing nonprofit leaders, they always tell us, yeah, we're looking for talent, right? We're looking mm -hmm. to fill this position or that position. I'm like, all right, if we can connect the dots here. And and so that's that's one group I really enjoy. Yeah. And the, the, the second is what I would call kind of mid-career mm. plateau. You know, they, they've been in the sector, but they've kind of hit a wall. Uh, and so a lot of the folks I'm coaching now are like, you know, I love this work, but I'd, I'd like to be an executive director, you know. I've got a referral find... for you. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I know somebody, so I'll, uh, I'll pass their name along to you. That, That's... I won't say who, but. Well, hey, I'll follow up with you. Please do, because that <laughs> I love to help someone like that because we need them. And often they, you know, they they are willing to self-assess and they're like, hey, there's some things I need to work on. I'm like, all right, let's let's build a plan. Yeah. Let's help you build a plan because we need you to be a leader. Um, because that third group is in fact the current nonprofit leader who still wants help. Yeah. Right. It, it David, it's a lonely world, I think, as I talk to a lot of executive directors, because now they've reached the top. But 
who do they talk to? You know, they can't talk to their board about everything. They can't talk to their staff. And so I hope, you know, what we're trying to do is create community for yeah. that audience as well. Well, there's, yeah. And there's some great organizations out there helping to, I think, bring those together. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like Mission Triangle here in Raleigh. Uh, Heard good things. But, yeah, yes. but they do good work of of bringing those nonprofit leaders together and really doing some coaching and some some of those sorts of things, right? And, and giving them a place to 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 gather, right? Yes. And just to share and to do that. Uh, there's a mission Charlotte now that's just gotten started. Um, and, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of other, uh, down in Wilmington, the Harrelson center is doing great work, uh, bringing things together. So creating community, leaving though, somebody right? out, go ahead. Yeah. Creating community though, right. Yeah. For exactly right. Yeah. And I think, you know, and that's, I think that that's what helps to build a stronger state of nonprofits, right. When we're Indeed. all working together, I, and again, this is a this is another trope along with the, you know, with the budget myth. But, you know, I mean, are are we in competition or are we working? You know, you know what? I get frustrated because I I I get this sense of, well, we've got to, you know, we've got to hunker down and we just, you know, we can't share with anybody because I'm afraid they're going to, you know, I don't want them to take my donors. I don't want them to take them. You know, I, I, we're competing. Right. And yes. Right. I, I reject that, right? I mean, I reject that fully. So talk talk about that. I couldn't agree more. There's enough money to go around. Amen. Um, if if, but again, we can't just kind of sit back and expect the money to find us, right? And I, and I think sometimes organizations, you know, expect that, and they want a magic bullet, right? Just yeah. just design me a, a direct mail piece, <laughs> David. That that I don't have to do anything else. You know, right. mail it yeah. out, and money comes in. Yeah. Um, Red but flag. no, I think if we're willing to articulate our case carefully and effectively, there are donors that will help you. But you do have to be willing to collaborate. I find increasing number of donors that like, all right, I like what you're doing, but I, I see two other organizations in town doing something similar. Yeah. So either you need to tell me why what you do is unique or tell me how you're going to work together with those, because right. ultimately that's the mission. Yeah, no, I'm with you 100% there. That's great. Well, um, definitely want to be respectful of your time, our listeners' time here. But, uh, you know, any any final words, anything that you could share with nonprofit leaders, uh, you know, uh, certainly, you know, I would recommend they reach out to you if they want to learn more about leadership and how to be better leaders. But Thank aside you. from doing your own marketing right now, what, uh, <laughs> not that you would, but aside from doing your own marketing right now, what, uh, what would you like to have nonprofit leaders walk away with today? Yeah, well, I, I, I would echo what you said, building on the community. There are, there are opportunities for community. Find your community. And, and again, I would start with just a couple of comparable peers and aspirational peers. So in other words, I'm not saying you, you want or have the time to socialize with everybody in the sector, but reach out to two people that are doing a job similar to yours. And I'm, I feel certain there will be a mutual benefit. And then consider who are some of your aspirational kind of heroes in the sector Yeah, that, that maybe would connect because so often they are willing to take your call. If you're yeah. respectful in the outreach, they don't mind sharing their story because they know if they help you, it, you know, it comes around to benefit everybody in the sector. So I hope, David, what you're doing, by the way, congratulations, is creating community. And that's what I would encourage more of. Well, I think that's great. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, I think we both enjoy LinkedIn, right? I mean, that's, a, you know, I think we, we spend a little bit of time on there. I think that's where we connected. So, Indeed. you know, I would, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've found so many great connections on there. I think, I honestly think everybody that I'm interviewing so far for most of these kind of podcasts and all that we're doing, I met on LinkedIn, right? So uh, if uh, for me, one last thing, if everybody, if you're not on LinkedIn and you're not connecting it with people, uh, you should be. I mean, it's it's such a great, great point. And so, you know, just from a practical standpoint, that's, uh, you know, I've actually done a few like you know, LinkedIn how to's right with nonprofit leaders and telling them, okay, here's how, you know, here's how you do this, right? Here's how you connect. And, you know, they've had some really neat results from that, that they've talking to people that they 
you know, they had no clue as to that they could even connect with, right? Just, you know, they didn't even know they existed. So it's great. Um, well, Patton, how can um, how can some folks find out about you and uh, your organization and, and and find out how to work with you? Well, I'll start with LinkedIn. You said it beautifully. <laughs> LinkedIn is where I am most active amongst the social media channels. So Patton McDowell on LinkedIn. Also, PMA Nonprofit Leadership on LinkedIn uh, is another kind of platform. That's and then our little... web our website is PattonMcDowell.com. Okay. And that's where you can find out more about the Mastermind Program and your path to nonprofit leadership, the podcast. And in fact, I wrote a book last year entitled Look Your Path you. to Nonprofit Leadership. And so if you're interested in reading more or learning more, uh, go to PattonMcDowell.com and you can find all of that. That's cool. Yeah, I admire anybody who can write a book. I, mean, I just, <laughs> oh. I, it just, I, you know, I think about it and I'm like, it just hurts to. I think finally about it. got it done, David. Yeah, how long did it take those, you? Know, probably two years, but okay. you know, off and on. Yeah, you know, obviously okay. I'm still working. And I'll have to have that conversation with you one day. I, I would love to. You can get it done. You can get it done. You just have to. I don't know, man. Build it, a plan. It, it scares me. So, <laughs> well, Patton, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, Angelo Creative, you can find out more about us at angelocreative.com. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, find out more about this podcast, we're always looking for great, uh, great uh, interviews. So we'd love to have that. Uh, you can reach me at just david at angelocreative.com and, uh, you know, check out our state, our uh, nonprofit state of minds podcast. I think we're on the whatever platforms are out there, Spotify and all those. So uh, I hope everybody will listen to that. We have more episodes coming. So Patton, thank you so much for your time, for your insights and for all the work you do to help make our state a stronger state of nonprofits. My pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for letting us pick your mind.